Welcome to the Sage 300 Tips training. Amanda here from Marketing and I'm joined by our senior Sage consultant, William Woolmer in sunny Brisbane. He's going to take us through his top 10 or 11 Sage 300 tips for 2020. So take it away, William. Thanks, Amanda. Hello, all. I'm William Woolmer. I'm uh, in our Brisbane microchannel office, as Amanda said, uh, enjoying the good weather. Uh, so, and for those who don't know me, I've uh, been working with Sage 300 uh, for many years. Uh, the aim of this presentation is to give you some uh, of the classics. There's some really uh, excellent uh, power tips that uh, some people have never seen or some have seen and forgotten. Uh, well worth sh uh, sharing some of these points that, you, that resonate with you. Make sure you share them with your wider team. Uh, it's not uncommon. We go to a client uh, and two or three people know exactly what I'm talking about and say, yeah, that's great. And other people in the same room look at them and say, you what? That could have saved me so much uh, aggravation. So, uh, yeah, uh, share and enjoy. Uh, one comment, I'm using the current version of Sage 2020, the latest update. So there's some features in there that have only come in in that update. So do... Uh, just keep that in mind if you go look at your system and you don't see every other step. Okay, so if you can see my screen, we've got a number of tips that we're going to run through, which you may have seen already. So I won't read them all out, uh, but I'll go through them one at a time. The first thing I'd like to look at is multiple contacts. This is a, a new feature in the uh, later versions of Sage. Some features also, a quick note, are only available for those uh, on subscription, which is a new way Sage is uh, licensing. So uh, I do recommend, if you can, if it works for your model, to move to subscription because you get more for the same cost. Okay, so multiple contacts, what are they? Inside Cat Sage Common Services, uh, a new uh, folder, and in there you can put contacts, individuals. And so these humans have information about them, but notice it's not a sign, it's not a customer, it's not a vendor, it's just a human. So we set those all up, so that's reasonable. We'll give them a, a, a code, as you can see here. Once you've created those, let me just quickly uh, show you that inside Sage. So under multiple contacts, and you can have as many as you like. So you can see my massive effort I've put in two into this uh, test system. Okay, so for us, we have a range of information. Probably the most important is the email. Uh, and do they consent to receiving? So you might have information about people who aren't getting emails, you take that tick off. An optional field. So it also supports the full Sage optional fields, which makes it very flexible and powerful indeed. Then uh, back to how we use them. So we assign them to vendors and customers. It's the principal use. So if I look at a vendor, I can go into the contact screen and I can choose to use multiple contacts in which case I can assign as many as I wish into this vendor. So back in Sage, under vendor 1200. So under contacts, you can see, well, here are, I have done two. So these contacts are assigned into the vendor and you can have none or many. And as you can see, it's an unlimited field. From here, I can also create new contact, which just launches that price spring. And as you can see, I can assign what people can receive. So this person can, a Smith can receive letters or not. So that's great. You can have someone who's the purchasing officer versus a finance officer uh, and uh, assign that. Okay. The, exactly the same occurs over in uh, customers. Uh, the next trick, though, inside the uh, processing of the vendor is we set them up so that we allow multiple contacts. Okay, so the emails are then assigned just by themselves. Multiple contacts is useful, but being able to send an email uh, or a, um, uh, a return to them using that contact information. Over in customers, it's the same thing. So... If I look at my demo, I chose 1100 with some information. And there we go. So the same customer, our contact, of course, would be necessarily separate. Again, if it's a customer, am I choosing to use multiple contacts? Yes. So how does that work, though, when we're processing? The key is that I don't do anything different because I'm choosing 
to send emails to the multiple contacts. So when I run uh, a report where emails are an option, which would in say AR be a simple invoice, if I choose customer, and this is an invoice for customer uh, 1100, it will send the invoice automatically using the standard method that Sage has always used to everyone with a tick in invoices, in which case is only William Warmer. So um, that's the function. So I think quite a useful function and not to be um, uh, confused with, um, there's another couple of tools which do this external to Sage, which have more features again, but you have to purchase as a separate module. This is inherent to Sage. It's part of the uh, latest update for the right, um, for the right versions. Another feature which is available in the most recent uh, iteration of Sage is uh, bank feeds. Now, bank feeds have been asked for for a long time, so this is automation of information from your bank into Sage, EFTs the other way. And so bank feeds allow us to do this, and because it's on the cloud, it's part of a, a tool that Sage has built independently. Sage has this uh, big tool which links to all banks, and then we link to the tool. It's on the cloud, so they've attached it to their subscription model. So I find this is a, a mildly compelling argument to move to subscription if, uh, if you haven't seen other reasons. Um, as I mentioned, they're also going to continue to build cloud boast components linked into Classic Sage, and so it, uh, it makes sense to, to pick up that. In the slide pack, which you should receive, uh, you will notice there a YouTube uh, link. You can just Google it. Um, this is a, a full demo of the uh, bank feeds, so you can go and see that in real time. Um, let me just show you on this uh, system how it looks. So this uh, button here, reconcile e-statements, I believe that's generic to all, but it won't show the information top right unless you've got the uh, bank, uh, bank feeds activated in your licensing. So this is the new part of it. You can connect a bank or get rid of it and reconnect it. So if I just show you the connect screen and not go much further forward, um, it allows you to select your country, your bank. And as you can see, there's some key banks. If you go to other, we'll see a much more extensive list of banks here in Australia. So it may not have yours, but if it doesn't, uh, knock on Sage's door. You can see there's quite a few like fire services, credit union I didn't know existed until that second. So um, as a number of banks, then you specify your account, you log in with your details, it's all securely transmitted as you'd hope. And then it just says, thanks, I've done it. Once it's connected, it looks like this and you hit get transactions. So the get transactions will look at the dates and get any current transactions based on the cutoffs that you've put into the reconciliation. Once you've got a transaction, it looks like this on your screen. So what it does is tries to match, and there's a set of matching rules again that you can see in the documentation. Obviously the uh, things like the, the amount is key, uh, the reference code, uh, if, it's, if it can look the transaction number and if it can match that. It uses a cascading series of matching rules to try to do the work for you. Great. What if it's not there? It's a lease payment. You've never stuck it into Sage before and it just pops up every month. Um, you can then just click on bank entry and assign information into that entry. So, okay, something about leasing. So, oh, thanks very much. And make a comment um, and process. Are you sure? Yes. So it's going to add this back into Sage and it, it's been drawn. Thank you very much for lots of positive messages. It's really big on the happies. So notice it's cleared. Yes. So that's it. It's done. You've added a new entry, which you had no idea of before this second, and it's all been coded and it's all been cleared on your bank rec. So uh, it's quite useful. Uh, and I think um, there's, there's, there's good argument that most of us will get something out of it. Very tiny banks and not much going on, maybe not, but I think it's good. Okay, so I'm going to leave that there, but just making the point that that, uh, that demo video has got quite a bit for you if you wish to go through that.
Now back to some more classic power tips and apologies for all those who I've been uh, beating this uh, this drum for a very long time uh, with many people. Sage has got a finder which used to be, out of curiosity, called SmartFinder and used to have to pay $1,500 to get it. Now they bought that company a dozen years ago and um, that was good because with him we didn't have to sell it. It was part of Sage. SmartFinder is quite intelligent and it does a lot more than just a simple text search. Uh, so let's look at some of the features that I'd like to point out. The first and most uh, useful out of the box is the ability to add, um, if I had to stay with customers, I think we love our customers more than our vendors normally. The ability to add columns. So if you hit the finder, now I'm in the right place. If you hit settings, and that's hidden away there, columns. Again, that's on the uh, slide pack that we've got. When you come to it normally, it looks like this. So here's a whole list of those selected and those available. I've just turned it off so I can show you how I pick it up. I One I like to, to add, and there's, there's a lot of information here. I'm just flipping up and down. This is every dot of information available on the master customer screen, which is in the background here. So that's a lot of different fields, amounts, dates, uh, all sorts of stuff, including uh, all the optional fields. So if you add an optional field into customers like what is their classification to me? Small, medium, large, non-government. Okay, so then I I can see those all properly rendered in the finder straight away. But I'm going to choose balance, which is fantastic. So I can see the current balance of the customer. Hit up a half dozen or two dozen times. Hit OK. And then the balance will appear and here it is. So this is how much you owe the customers at this second. It's not a it's not a trial balance at the end of last month. It's just a this second trial balance. But isn't that great? So I can see I love this customer less than I love this customer because they're working more for me or maybe they're a delinquent. Um, either way, that's a great dot of data. And I make the point, this is the finder. So you can now say, show me something about that money. So greater than zero. So these are the customers with bucks. And more importantly, maybe for the hard, you know, I've got to go reconcile something. This is the credit note customer. So I find that quite empowering. Oh, this is not equals if you like that stuff. So I find that your ability to do that quite empowering. And this is just one finder in one screen. As we know, Sage has got, uh, if not hundreds, nearly throughout the system. So it's per person as well. So if you modify yours, go tell your friends because they won't see it because we all have our own requirements. So that finder, just the quick point, settings columns. Moving on. The next thing that I'd like to show you in the Sage world of finders, if I can just get my PowerPoint running again, is that the item finder contains quantities. This is not news and it's not even hidden, but it's just a note because I think it is something quite powerful and not always understood, is that wherever you go to see an item, you can also see the quantities. And uh, look, I'll just use the picture there, it's faster. So that's nice. That's also in any purchase order, in any sales order. Wherever you can see an item finder, go to the right and it tells you the quantities, which is actually a common requirement. And that's why it's in there. These are the quantities as at that second. Um, and because they're quantities, they're also correct. If you receipted something five seconds ago, this finder, when refreshed, is correct. Okay, great. Filters. The finders have filters. So what do they do for us? They allow us to multi-search. So uh, if we look at, where was I? I'm in customers here. So I could do this from any finder that launches customers. So here we go. I think I just turned this off. Set criteria. So those who are using it know very well what I'm talking about. If you click on that, this is the multiple filter screen. Nice thing is, when I say multiple, I mean infinite. Okay, 100,000. So you can continue to add extra filters and they can have multiple rules. That's why it's this confusing grid. But it's not that hard. So if I choose something uh, that I like, like terms, if I press add, now I've created that a column. And then I click into the first box and just type my rule. And today it's N30, is, is a term code, net 30. Then I hit save. Now my, uh, and okay, or whatever. Now my finder only shows me N30s. Quite powerful because you can use it for multiples at a time. 
So status, that means active or inactive. So if I choose that, it's friendly. It says, oh, don't, don't worry about what the field name is or the field data. You just use, here's a friendly name. So active. So I only want active only. Uh, hit save, OK. And it's only active. That doesn't make me very uh, any good data for you to see. So I'm removing the other filter. And you can see that I've only got actives. If I remove that, just keep your eye on that bottom line there. Uh, so delete that, save that. Well, okay, I'm not clever enough to have any inactive customers, but the the uh, the functionality there it is. Every finder, every person separate. So that's nice. Only trick, and it is a trick. You have to remember it's on. <laughs> so if you put your filter, which is classic, you want this, your users to only see active items because the inactive items are a pain in the bum and people select them and then you've got the wrong data. Uh, or it gives them an error and they get annoyed, says you cannot use that item, it's inactive. So to get rid of that, go into their finder on the screen they're using and set criteria. Okay. Um, and look, there's my lovely description of it. Still in um, the sort of more technical area, when you export from Sage, which is a, a highly used and functional area, so we can export out to Excel and CSV and so on, there's a little button up here which is rarely used, so I thought to point it out. It tells you what fields you can export. Now, you can already see this in the list, so I'm not actually giving you anything particularly uh, incredible, but uh, if I just, so there's the same list. Oh, look, <laughs> yes, customer name, a short name, Gruger. But two things, it's um, telling you also the type, which gives you some more information. And it's also in a separate screen that you can uh, that you can manipulate or look at. So just a little bit more data. Remembering also when you do export, uh, you have to pick the red because they're the keys. Another minor trick is if you are exporting, you don't want to get, see all these darn fields, it's endless, okay? If you want to unpick them all except for the first five, you're going to be hit for 10 minutes, go and get a cup of coffee or just use the feature, right click, unselect all. So for this group, I've unselected all, now I can just select the ones I want, remembering to include the key. So that's a neat little couple of export moments. Uh, okay, the next point again, staying in the data world, so apologies for those who don't um, really want to work so much with data, is that the uh, Sage has the ability to show you all of the tables, and all of the um, definitions for them. Uh, it's kept outside of Sage in, uh, would you believe, a bunch of table links called application object models. Your consultant or even help desk, if you're on that, can give you this. It's only a small file. You could probably Google on the web, but sometimes it's a bit hard to pull it down. Get it for the, your version, although the older versions, they don't move tables very fast. What are they? Go to accounts payable. It's a great big list. Go to tables, don't worry about the rest. This is the raw tables or are inside your Microsoft SQL database. And when you export them, that's what they look like. So you already may be used to that if you're exporting. So if I go to a table, uh, we're familiar with these, called vendors, no, no biggie. And in there, I can see all of the grungy detail. Again, it looks a lot like that export. But not only that, it also tells me the codes. So zero is the true status code, which means inactive. And some of them are hard, like zero is none, one is warning, two is error. So you, this is actually very useful. If you're ever exporting or directly linking to your data or reporting on it, you're looking at these fields. So do, um, do take advantage of this like, very deep dictionary of every field in Sage uh, with very few exceptions. Okay, so there's the picture to give you the hint. And, oh, look, I did say it's hard to find. Well, I found it for you, aren't I good? So <laughs> let's not blow our own trumpet too much, but Sage has given it to us, and that's likely the most recent versions. Next, I'd like to briefly touch on a tool called Ops Inquiry. It's most relevant, of course, for those using the operation modules. So apologies if you're only in finance uh, and don't touch inventory. But if you do touch inventory, this is a, a must must have. I'm not going to show you all the detail of this tool just to point it out because I, I have seen cases where people are not aware of it and even so it's in, in their system. So, you know, jump in. 
Uh, okay, so what it is is a tool which allows you to search on all of your items. As you can see, it's slightly different to the remainder of Sage. It does its own indexing to make it as fast as it can. Um, once you've found an item, then it shows you all the detail. Importantly, all the detail. So when you go to Sage, you want to find the price of a, a sales price of an item and what vendors sell that item to you and what quantities you're allowed to use and uh, who do you buy it from uh, and so on, or who have you sold it to in the past. All that's in different screens and in different modules. A lot of the sales stuff's in the sales module. Or come here, it's all in one place. So if I look at the sales, these are the current sales orders that are outstanding on this item. Uh, this is the, the history of the customers purchasing it by customer. Or if that's too hard, look at it in summary because that's by period. So that's quite nice. Here's a period-based sales report on this item. It's all on one item. The one I like most is called Stock Card. So Stock Card is the old-fashioned opening for the month, movements and closing. Very useful. So if you look at this, 2009, in period one, we had none. We received 55 with some money. And at the end of the period, we had 55 with some money. And it moves on, start of the period and so on. So it's just that. Um, be aware that it's done by location. So location one goes up to 2020 and then it starts again in location two. I find that uh, very useful when I'm trying to understand or reconcile an item, what, what's going on. It's hard to get your head around thousands of tiny movements. This summarizes all of the things that can happen to an item into one screen. So I'm a big fan, as you can see. Okay, the next thing I'd like to point out, if I can find my... Uh, presentation is this images so it has a limited but existing image ability it's only small but uh nice to have it lives inside ops inquiry which is why we're talking about it now in ops inquiry you have to turn it on for those with permissions so grab your your uh, systems administrator turn on use item picture choose a directory to store them in Put some pictures in that directory. <laughs> that's not too hard. But um, so that's a, just they're just sitting in there as JPEGs because I told it's JPEG, and they have the item code as the name. So very simplistic, and only one picture per. But it's one's better than none. And you go to the units tab as you saw in the previous image, and there is the picture. So it's automatically picked up if it's in the folder. And I have some clients who put a document in there with that name because that's something to do with, you may even have a document about uh, your uh, hazard materials sheet, or you may use it for some sort of contract or purchasing thing. But again, it's only one document. Uh, and so, you know, as we move through, you can get some different pickies and that's how easy it is. Uh, again, only available in Ops Inquiry. Having a folder of pictures is not a bad idea. Also, uh, for those who want to get grungier, you can apply those maybe to reporting. Uh, it doesn't just have to live here. I've now got some data, haven't I? Okay. Keyboard shortcuts. So Sage has always had a number like the good old fashioned F9 to launch detail, F5 to launch the finder. You don't have to remember them. Sage will tell you. You can go to help a couple of ways in Sage. The easiest way is to... Um, Go to a screen, so here's a screen. Press F1 on the keyboard, which is the Microsoft paradigm for help. And then you come up with the help screen that you're expecting about vendors. That by itself, of course, very useful. There's your fields. But what I'm suggesting today is to search for keyboard. I've done that before. And in the search results, it's uh, from my own recollection, it's the one called tables. So uh, in that list, you'll see a range of uh, keyboard options, including uh, the classic. So if I look at the screenshot here, so you'll find things such as F5, F7, F9, which you may already be using. Um, the Alt key is also very powerful. So if you hit Alt something, it may do such as save a new record or um, close is Alt C. So Alt, pretty much anything with an underline on the control in Sage allows you to run it. Next up is our tip for Sage keyboard shortcuts. Always classic, if you're doing bulk entry, do consider the screen and how you can move around it without your mouse. It is more efficient, it always has been. Uh, the way to do that is to open Sage and 
look at the uh, choices that you get in front of you under the shortcuts screen. So you don't need to actually remember these. Uh, so if I go to my copy of Sage, I uh, go to help. It's web-based. In there, pick the word keyboard. I've done this before. And the fourth one down, I find data entry tools. That's the key. And there's the list on the web for you to review. Um, it's also got some other information here, which don't ignore that. Uh, so there's a number of uh, there's a number of tips in there which will be useful. Uh, many people know these. Don't forget your uh, compatriots. They may not realise that you're navigating at a faster rate than they are. From here, another minor but important feature in Sage is a calculator. In any numeric field, not just inside data entry grids, you can click the plus key and it will bring up this minor calculator. Let me demonstrate that. So if we find a number field, uh, which we can edit into, so uh, here's one we made before. So I might just pick up a field which we might be processing in. And you may have a, a field that you have to do a calculation on. So if I pick up an open batch, so here's an amount. Okay. So what's the document amount? It's 1100 divided by my birthday and time something or other. Well, I might not know it. If I press plus on the keyboard, it was plus on the keyboard, pops up this um, classic little calendar. First thing is that you don't have to go find some other thing. It's just one key. It shows the number in the calendar, so it translates your number in. You can do maths on it times 0.9 because of some reason that you'll tell me. So, okay, that's fine. Then how do I get it back into my field? Just click paste. Okay, very simple, not at all particularly clever. Um, you know, it's not up for AI tool of the year award, but there it is. So, you know, um, it's the old war paradigm. Uh, give me a workable plan now, not a perfect plan tomorrow. This is workable. Removing buttons. Okay, so. In front of us is how it's done. Let me just show you very briefly and move on. Why? Security. So you'll ask me to change the security so this person can enter and save a document, but this person can enter the same document and not see all of these little fields that they might make it wrong. So it's a classic. You can remove fields that you don't need. So uh, it might be security can't post. Well, if I don't have that security rights in the Sage authorizations, it's not that granular maybe, then I'll say, well, I can just pull the button away and you'll go like that. Or we may be processing, especially if you're keyboard processing, you tap, 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 through all those 10 fields you don't use. I go, well, would you like to remove the fields? So you hit tab once and it jumps you to the next one. It can just clean the screen. And it does actually help because the tab order of Sage goes through every field in front of you. How do we do it? Uh, for those with authority to get into the back end of Sage. There's this UI, UI profile spot, UI meaning user interface. Give it an ID. Here's one we made before, salespeople only. You just have to give it an ID. Then you do that and hit save. Then the admin user only goes to the screen, goes into the area that we want to clean classically maybe a sales order, but it could be a geo journal, it could be anything in Sage that's got a screen, which is everything. And there's the secret, file customized, only for admin. So you won't see this, so don't be disappointed, you've done nothing wrong. Okay, so under there, pick your profile, sales. Ah, look, I probably thought through that, didn't I? So, and the, and the, uh, the problem I've set myself, of course, a very neat one is, William, can you please remove something in here, like order type, because we don't want quotes. By the way, you know, you can make quotes and so on in this, but you say, no, William, we do not want quotes because they're never part of our system and it, people have been pressing that button and making things go wrong. So then with my free head, I've got to find order type. There it is. So it's just buried amongst all this crud. You take the tick off. That's how hard it is. Boom, it's gone. So it's only gone though for people who are in the sales group. So let me show you that. So I hit OK. It's not gone for me. What's happened? Ah, well, I'm admin. I can do everything. We have the power of the deity. So back into common services, back to, oh, sorry, admin. 
uh, now assign. So the third step, step one, make a thing. Step two, add good stuff to it. Step three, add people to the good thing. So who's in sales? Well, test is in sales. So I can press insert on the keyboard, that old sage chestnut. Choose someone else and you're also in sales. So everything, everyone in sales, when they log in, automatically this profile is applied to them and they can't see that rule. I can have hundreds of rules on the sales group. I just chose one, but I can have many on the same screen, on other screens, anywhere I like. Remove buttons, whatever I like. So there you go. I find it quite useful. If you can see a use for it, it's not too hard, but the person who is admin has to do that. And my slideshow gives you the hint. Look at that, all the steps laid out for us, except for the last one where he assigned the users. So, okay, two of the steps. I'll take that criticism. All right, copy orders. What the heck is that about? So when we're doing sales, if you're doing that, and in purchasing, uh, but not quite as funky, there's a copy orders thing. So if you go to order entry, pick up an order. It's as hard as it looks. <laughs> you find an order. So first find an order, rule one. Step two, you go, oh, that's a quote. Get out of there. I did say we had quotes. There's an order. I want to copy it. I would like to repeat this order because this customer. So first find the customer. So that's great because you've got a history of years long, tens of thousands of sales orders. Go find their last one. Very useful. Oh, look, there's this really excellent finder. Did I mention that? Oh, hey, look, it also has color. <laughs> go, even though it's spelt in the Canadian way. So go look that up. Anyway, after you've got excited with your finder and come back, copy order. Look at that. That's as simple as it is. Again, this is a good plan today. What this will do is allow you to create a new order based on the old one and even change the customer. I certainly change some of the other information, but that'll do. When you click that button there, all of the detail that was on the old one, all 200 painfully typed lines are in front of us. And you go, I don't want that one on today's order. Fair enough. And it's not $100, it's now 105. So it's just picking up the old orders information. Then you hit create, so you know, Look at me, how fast am I typing my orders? Time for coffee. Okay, and it's just done it. And it's done it so fast, it's not even talking to us. That's unfriendly. And there's a new order, very similar to my old one, but one line less. And look, if we look at the bucks, he crosses his finger. Yes, it's $105. And it's an open order. It's not special and you, you're not locked out of it or anything. It's a normal boring order. P.S. There it is there in that screen. You may already be using it, but I just like my little shortcut under order entry. Because I like to be fair, I mentioned that it also exists in PO, but it doesn't have a little copy current PO for Sage reasons. But you can use the normal PO screen uh, for copying, which is there. There it is in yellow on the PO purchase orders module. So that actually is nearly sometimes more demanded than orders because you may have a regular income in order in, but stuff out is random. Okay. Sage Intelligence. Sage Intelligence is a business intelligence tool and it's quite uh, good. It comes in the box with Sage, but, and here's the trick, there's always the trick. It comes in the what you get is what you get box. So you can use it, you can preview it, you can't modify them and you can't expand on the quite extensive functionality until you pay a little bit of money, but it's pretty good because it's not too much money compared to other BIs which make your eyes really peel back. Um, however, there is an enormous, well, okay, a 50 deep library of, uh, of um, reports written for Sage 300, and here they are. I've copied every one of them as at the nows onto this screen. So if any of those names excite you, you're allowed to have them. Again, you may need some sort of permissions in Sage, but uh, get your administrator to do this. They go to the um, the website, and look at that. Uh, they go here, <laughs> you can search for it, but look right there. You download this thing, wait until the end of this presentation, I know you're excited. and uh, and this thing looks like this. It's just a little screen. And it immediately goes, oh, hang on, I know what I've got to do. It goes and gets all the current reports at this second and ticks most of them for some random reason based on what modules you have. I'd strongly suggest you select none and then go and find a few that float your boat. You know, maybe the top five vendors. Just get a few at first. Hit download and it will. It takes a minute, so I've done it before. Admin's intelligence reporting, report viewer. So this is where it is. Again, if you don't see this on your screen, maybe it's not activated, maybe you don't have permissions. If you need it, um, you know, have a word with your sysadmin. 
what does it do? It puts these new funky, never before seen by you reports into this folder called new reports. So what? You run it and it does whatever it says on the box. It's very useful, I think, because I didn't have to do too much thinking. I just press the button and there it is. And that's really what the ultimate point of reporting is. If you're not running order entry, don't worry. This is just the sales master, which essentially gives us a lot of detail on those sales for an item, which yes, you remember, you can get that in Ops Inquiry as well, but that's on screen and you can't wriggle with it, which you can in Excel's pivot tables. So one moment. All that good stuff, if you haven't played too much with intelligence reporting, is actually building all the data, building the spreadsheet, naming the ranges, do all the exciting things in Excel that it has to do. Uh, there it is there. Boom. Okay, exciting looking pivot table, lots of sage green. So if you like green, this is the place you need to be. Okay, I'm not going to wrap it on about pivot tables, but look, it's, this is by item, by customer by item, now it's by item by customer. Okay, you know, this is pivot table. And this is functional and uh, source currency in case you're multi-currency, which would cause your brain to explode otherwise. And it's got hidden stuff in it, which I just quickly point out, I can't help myself, the actual um, data. <laughs> not, a, not a zero number of clients go, lovely report, Will, give me the data, get out of here. Okay, okay, I don't care. So this is the data, so go play. So, so we, most of us know Excel quite well. Most of my clients know it better than me. So do get in here and play. And the nice thing is this is data derived this moment by user-driven process. It's not, not complex and all back uh, backdoor stuff. Moving on, so I would recommend for those who see any value in some of those BI reports to, um, to pick up this re report utility and use that. Moving on, uh, bonus tip. I said I'd give you these 10 or 11 tips and here's number 12. So this is a tool which uh, some may well be familiar with, how to create GL journals straight to the GL from Excel. Again, love being Excel because I can link it to all my sheets that I've used my reconciliations and worksheets on. And then I want to generate a simple list and just press a friendly button, please, in Excel. So here's the friendly button. This is a little tool. This is the only one that's not in the box of Sage. We've written it. It's not that expensive. It's inexpensive because it's a small module. Looks like this on the screen. So you get to um, have lookups, which will show you, um, well, GL accounts and so on uh, that you can pick out of Sage. You can copy and paste. You can drop and drag. It's just the, not drag. You can drop and copy or whatever you can do in Excel. So we have a lot of clients use this for recurring journals, like your accruals at the end of the month, maybe your payroll journals, long and awkward. You may certainly use it um, and keep them as Excel sheets, just file them. And, but they just happen to be Excel sheets with a tool which made the, so you click on that and it will create the batch in Sage. I won't click it now because this is demo system and my login to Excel may not be everything it's cut up to be. But that's as hard as it is. So it's quite functional and I do recommend it for those who are doing long or tedious Excel uh, wrong, long or tedious uh, geo journals. It's good. I will though, out of the box mention that you do have the opportunity to make recurring entries in Sage. So you may recall that, uh, that under, heck, where is my recurring entries? There it is. You can create recurring entry journals, which look like a boring geo journal. They're, uh, cookie cutter stuff and then when you wish to you can create that again every month so sage has a it's not a bad recurring function but it's not excel with all its links and copying and doing it uh in every direction this is a more fixed this is my template create that every month change the figures hit post okay so uh i think i've come under my uh, self-imposed 40 minute limit here <laughs> thank you william and yeah, here are our account managers. I'm sure a lot of you know who your account manager is already. And um, that's their addresses if you need to, to reach out to them. This is the end of the session. So thanks everyone for coming and have a fabulous day. Thank you. Thank you.